Good evening. Thank you all for attending this presentation tonight on the transformational leadership of General Lewis Hugh Wilson. In October 2013, the commander of Marine Corps recruiting in Alabama and I paid a visit to the current president of Birmingham Southern College, General Charles Krulak, who also served as the 31st Commandant of the Marine Corps. And as Major Mike Hayes and I were ushered into General Krulak's office, and we sat down at his little table, General Krulak began to talk to us about the state of recruiting and making Marines. We were very happy to report to our former Commandant that we had never gotten as high a quality young Marine as we were getting, that our quality indicators in every measurable category were literally off the charts and were still getting better. General Krulak was very happy to hear that. He commented that when he was Commandant, he made recruiting and making Marines his top priority. And he said that the quality wasn't always as good as it is right now. And then he reflected back on his time as a major and lieutenant colonel. And he grew nostalgic. And he nodded his head. And he said, yes, Lou Wilson saved the Marine Corps. Now, coming from the son of Lieutenant General Victor H. Brute Krulak, who was one of the pioneers of amphibious assault, who helped invent the doctrine of vertical envelopment, which is the military use of the helicopter, who had actually built a balsa wood model of the landing craft that would take Allied forces to victory in World War II. This was some statement. Coming from the godson of Lieutenant General Holland M. Howland Mad Smith, who was the commander of all the Marines on Iwo Jima, who planted the flag on Mount Suribachi, for which we just celebrated the 70th, 70th anniversary last month, this was some statement. I found General Krulak's statement to be all the more incredible because I had been walking by Lou Wilson's picture on the command board in my office for the past year and had never really thought too much about it. He is one of the 37 colonels who has held the post of the 6th Marine Corps District Commander. He's the only one who ever went on to make Commandant, but he held the post of 6th District Commander. So I began to do some reading on this extraordinary Marine. And the reading turned into research, and the research turned into me taking a trip up to the Gray Research Center at Quantico, Virginia, and actually going through General Wilson's archives. And what unfolded before me was such an epic and riveting tale of such tremendous strategic leadership, vision, willpower, and moral courage that is very special to be able to share with you here tonight. Because this the story of the transformational leadership of Lou Wilson is intertwined with that of the country's transition to an all-volunteer military force. And this story does not start in the White House. It does not start in the Beltway. It does not start in the Pentagon. And it doesn't start in the University of Chicago Economics Department. It passes through those places, but it doesn't start there. This story starts right here in Mississippi and down the road in Louisiana. It passes through two distant battlefields at Guam and the Chosin Reservoir and two young captains and what they would see there and what their Marines would do there. And then it comes back to the states. It passes through the recruit depots at San Diego, California, Paris Island, South Carolina, and the officer training grounds at Quantico, Virginia. It passes through Vietnam, and yes, 
It does go through the University of Chicago Economics Department. It goes through the White House and it goes through the Pentagon, but then it branches back out to more than 550 recruiting substations and 74 officer selection teams in the United States and the U.S. territories to include Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and yes, Guam. This is the story of the transformational leadership of General Lou Wilson. But in a larger sense, it's really the story of making Marines in the all-volunteer era. But in a still larger sense, it's the story of how a group of Marine Corps leaders, led by General Wilson, implemented a system of techniques and processes that have created the highest quality military organization in the history of the world. And they did it at a time when every environmental factor and external factor was weighted against them. But as I said, the story starts right here in Mississippi. Lou Wilson was born in Brandon, Mississippi, about 15 miles east of here, and his father passed away when the young Lou was five years old. He developed a deep and abiding sense of responsibility for his mother and his sister. He excelled as a young athlete, playing football and running track, and he came right here to Millsaps College. He played sports here at Millsaps College, excelling in football, excelling in track, and in the summers, working putting asphalt on the many dirt roads here in Mississippi. On one of these summer excursions, he met a beautiful young woman, beautiful young Mississippian named Jane Clark. They started dating, they fell in love, and by the time it came for Lou Wilson to graduate, he didn't want to spend his life with anybody else. But he also had a sense of adventure and he desired to serve his country. So he joined the Marine Corps Reserves after graduation and he earned his commission in November 1941 and we all know what happened in December 1941. The Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and World War II was underway. Jane Clark promised to wait for the young Lieutenant Wilson while he went off to the Pacific to fight our nation's wars. Lou Wilson went to Guadalcanal as a lieutenant. He received jungle training and he was able to participate in the campaign on Bougainville. Bougainville had many malaria infested swamps. It was the Japanese resorting to guerrilla tactics, but young Lieutenant Wilson excelled as a combat leader, came to the attention of his battalion commander, and by the next summer was in command of a company, of Fox Company, 2nd Battalion, 9th Marines, for the Marines' attack on Guam. The Marines' attack on Guam was part of a larger campaign, the Marianas Campaign. The Marines actually attacked three islands, Saipan, Tinian, and Guam, but Guam was the toughest. And as the 3rd Marine Division crossed the beach, it became apparent that the dominant terrain feature of Chinito Ridge would be pivotal, pivotal to the outcome on Guam. You can see a picture of Chinito Ridge there. You can see how it perfectly overlooks the landing beaches and how if you did not have Chinito Ridge, you were not going to get those Marines across the beach in the large numbers required to take Guam. Captain Wilson's company took its port part of Chinito Ridge after bitter fighting and then the ca young captain noted that there was another prominent feature up on Chinito Ridge, Fonte Hill, that the Japanese had taken back from the Marines. Captain Wilson hastily organized a 17 Marine patrol on his own initiative, and they went to take the, that hill from the Japanese. 13 of Captain Wilson's 17 Marines were struck down, but through fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting, they took Fonte Hill on Chinito Ridge. They held it long enough to be reinforced. 
and the Marines had taken Cheetah Ridge. The third Marine Division was able to get their Marines across the beach, and the Marines won the battle at one. For his action on Geneva Ridge, Captain Williams earned the Congressional Medal of Honor that was presented by Harry Truman in October 1945. There is an exhibit that shows the certificate next door in the library. Now, after the war, Major Bolt, he been promoted to Major, served at Marine Barracks, Washington, D.C., and then he was transferred to New York City to serve as officer in charge of a recruiting station. This wasn't an attack on Guam, but he was one of the very important skills here that he would use in the future. After serving as the officer in charge, of the previous day in New York City. He was promoted, and then went down to Quantico to be commanded the training battalion of officer candidates. So he got experience in training basic officer candidates to become sex defense. He went back out to California to command the sex defense fifth marine, and then he came back to serve as the commander of the basic school. The Marine Corps officer basic school is mandatory training for every officer in the Marine Corps, and it is where every officer learns how to be a basic infantry platoon leader. Whether you're gonna fly planes, you're gonna be a financial management officer, a logistics officer, or a supply officer, every Marine officer goes through the basic school, and Lou Wilson commanded the basic school. After commanding the basic school, he, went to, he served the tour in Vietnam, and then he came down to command the 6th Marine Corps District. He served the 6th Marine Corps District until he was promoted to general. Upon promotion to general, he served as the Commandant's liaison to the U.S. Congress. He served with the 3rd Marine Amphibious Force in Okinawa, Japan. And in 1975, he was in a position that some viewed as lofty exile in command of Marines in the Pacific. It was in his post in the Pacific in which the current commandant, that the then commandant, General Robert Cushman, asked General Wilson to submit his papers for retirement. In a move that was characteristic of the incredible courage Wilson had shown throughout his career, General Wilson refused to submit his papers for retirement. Because you see, in 1975, the Marine Corps was facing quite possibly the worst crisis of its 200 year existence. And this crisis was not precipitated by Marines losing a fight on some distant battlefield, but was potentially far worse. The Marines had begun to lose their reputation for elitism in the eyes of the American people. And General Wilson wanted to do something about it. This crisis of confidence in the Marine Corps was precipitated by the nation's transition to an all-volunteer force. Now, in the 1960s, there was an economics professor at the University of Chicago named Milton Friedman. He was one of the best known economists in the country at the time. He was a free market economist, and he began writing articles and papers questioning the validity of the draft. He said, in a free society, liberty is the most important virtue, and compelling people to serve their country in the military doesn't seem to make sense with this. He also made some very intelligent economic arguments against the draft. Two points specifically. First, he said that compelling people to serve their country in the military is depriving the economy of talented Americans because by getting Americans who could be earning a lot more in the economy contributing to the country's economic strength and contributing to the tax base by making them do something they don't want to do, i.e. serve in the military, we are hurting the economy. That was the first piece of the argument. 
The second piece was it's also against the free market because those Americans who do want to serve in the military will do so at an inherently lower wage than they could otherwise earn because the pay was kept low because the military did not have to compete for talent. So this was a quote unquote hidden tax against those young Americans who served in the military that they were not paid what they deserved. So these were the arguments, the intellectual arguments that Milton Friedman and other economists were making in the 1960s. Now presidential candidate Richard Nixon, who lost a tough election in 1960 to John F. Kennedy, and then lost another tough election as governor of California, was planning a political comeback. And he heard about these arguments, and he saw a political opportunity to first get young people's votes, and second, be true to free market economics and make an economic argument. And the political opposition really didn't know how to respond to this. Nixon won the election in 1968, and some of his advisors had urged him to go slow. They said, I know you made this part of your campaign, but we haven't really analyzed this. Go slow. President Nixon says right away, I want you to press forward. I, I meant what I said. This is a priority. I want the country to transition to an all-volunteer military force. The result was a commission, a bipartisan commission chaired by former Secretary of Defense Thomas Gates. Now Thomas Gates told Nixon, I am 100% against the idea. And Nixon said, that's exactly why I'm putting you in charge of this commission. If you come back and say it's a good idea, then I'll know that we need to do it. The Gates Commission was dominated by those economists who were on the commission. There were three economists on the commission. There were some retired four-star generals, there were some civil servants, and there were even some young people. The economists had been practicing their arguments for years. Milton Friedman was brilliant. He had the numbers, he had the data. He was able to produce all these. The result was the 15-member Gates Commission unanimously recommended to the president that the country transition to an all-volunteer force. Now the service chiefs unanimously were against it. The services said, this is the worst possible time in our country that we could be contemplating something like this. Respect for the military is at an all-time low. We have just come out of a bitter war that did not enjoy public support. There have been protests against the war. The military is not held in high regard by the American people right now because of the problems and because the outcome of the Vietnam War did not appear to be going well. So the service chief said they didn't want to do it. This was the worst time to do something like this. President Nixon said, press ahead. The Secretary of Defense, Melvin Laird, asked for two years to prepare the force because they knew that they would have to recruit him. So this was the context that the Marine Corps began its transition to an all-volunteer force. Now the Commandant at the time was General Robert Cushman. Robert Cushman had served as Nixon's aide when Nixon was Vice President. Cushman had been Captain Wilson's battalion commander during the attack on Guam. He'd been a battalion commander on Iwo Jima. He had held some important combat commands, but he did not have experience in the entry-level pipeline. Cushman's guidance was, we'll get the numbers, but getting the quality is going to mean very vigorous recruiting. Cushman's comment thus seemed to imply that getting the numbers was more important than getting the quality. At the same time, J. Walter Thompson, which was the Marine Corps' advertising agency, which had been doing it pro bono from World War II to the early 1970s, because J. Walter Thompson was a former Marine, they began doing some research, and they began letting the Commandant know, you know, your marketing pitch, we don't promise you a rose garden, 
has almost no appeal to today's youth. Less than 7% of the young people we've tested this with have responded favorably to it. This didn't seem to bother General Cushman because he thought the Marine Corps only really needs to apply to less than 7% of the youth. And I believe that 90% of our Marines are here because they want to be, not just because they got an unlucky draft card. So the Commandant ignored J. Walter Thompson. In January 1973, Secretary of Defense announced the draft has ended and all the services were now in the all-volunteer era. All right. Within six months, the Marine Corps was facing a full-blown crisis as the pool of recruits dried up and there weren't kids joining. They made their numbers, the Marine Corps made its numbers just like Cushman said they would, by enlisting fewer than 50% high school graduates for the remainder of fiscal year 73. Now the way fiscal years work, fiscal years start one October and they end 30 December, and then Congress will prepare a budget for the next fiscal year, which starts one October and ends the next 30 December. Congress saw what all the services were doing, not just the Marine Corps, by enlisting scores of non-high school graduates. So Congress put a resolution in the military appropriations budget for fiscal year 1974 saying the services had to enlist at least 55% high school graduates. General Cushman, the Marine Corps Commandant, did not believe in the value of a high school diploma to make a good Marine. He thought IQ tests were the best indicator and that you could train someone who is reasonably intelligent. The result was the unfortunate spectacle of a Marine Corps Commandant going up to the hill and asking Congress to lower the enlistment standards into the Marine Corps. And the results were predictably disastrous. Congress refused, the Marine Corps continued to miss, and the Marine Corps would miss its 1974 mission by 9,000 recruits. Each year we bring in about 34, 35,000, so this was about 25% of what our mission was for that year, the Marine Corps' mission for that year. So Congress, for the next fiscal year, granted some relief from Section 718, and the Marine Corps opened the floodgates and let thousands of low quality non-high school graduates into the ranks. And this, as you would probably expect, created even more problems. Before long, the Marine Corps had the worst disciplinary rates in the armed forces. We had more than 18,000 deserters. And because you had 18,000 Marines in a deserter status, there weren't Marines to maintain equipment or take care of gear, so readiness started to plummet. Because you didn't have Marines present for training, you could not conduct actual combined arms training, so the proficiency began to drop. And others saw this and began to question the viability of the Marine Corps' amphibious mission. I mean, in the atomic age, do we really need to conduct any more of these amphibious assaults? So think tanks and scholars at like the Brookings Institution started to wonder, do we really need this amphibious capability? The Navy, the Marine Corps is a naval service. The Navy saw it, and the Navy said, you know, why do we need these attack aircraft? So there was conflict with the Navy over the future of marine aviation. This was the situation in 1975 when General Wilson got interviewed to be the next Commandant of the Marine Corps. Senator Stennis, who was Chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee and other prominent congressmen and senators threw their support behind Wilson. Wilson was named as the 26th Commandant of the Marine Corps and in June 1975, took command of the Marine Corps and laid out his intent in one very short sentence. I call upon all Marines
to get in step and to do it smartly. Now, to say Wilson faced challenges would be a huge understatement. He had 18,000 Marines in a deserter status. The brigs were so full, commanders couldn't even put a Marine into the brig without taking one out. The drug culture had infected Marines. There were racial problems. There was plummeting readiness. There was a lack of training ranges to conduct combined arms training. And there was conflict with the Navy over the future of Marine aviation. Would the Marine Corps be able to keep fighter attack aircraft that could provide closer support in amphibious assaults? He knew he would need help, a lot of help, for the monumental challenges ahead, but he also knew just who to call. For at that time, there was a general who was in command at Marine Corps Recruit Depot, Paris Island, who shared Wilson's beliefs that the core strength of the Marine Corps was the high quality character and capabilities of the individual Marine. His name was Robert H. Barrow, and he's from just down the road in Louisiana. Barrow was born in 1922 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He grew up in a house without electricity in it, but the young Barrow loved to read. He got his hands on everything he could read and read by a kerosene lamp. He was the editor of his school newspaper and he attended LSU, which offered free tuition to in-state residents if you were in the Corps of Cadets. So the young Barrow joined the LSU Corps of Cadets and he worked part-time as a waiter and a janitor to get some spending money. During one semester, he saw a Marine officer on campus. He was inspired to join the officer program he enrolled in the platoon leaders class program, just like Captain Irwin is putting, Marine, putting officer candidates into the PLC program. But his itch to get into action caused him to drop his shot at a commission and to enlist in the Marine Corps as a boot private, and he shipped out to boot camp at San Diego. Barrow went out to San Diego. He clearly excelled as a recruit. They recognized his leadership ability, and he was asked to stay on as a drill instructor to help train other recruits as the Marine Corps expanded to wartime strength. Well, the drill instructors and the officers out there soon realized this young Barrow is very squared away. He may not have his college degree, but he has what it takes to be an officer. So they put him into a commissioning program. He went to officer candidate school, and he ended up in China, where he worked with Chinese guerrillas behind Japanese lines. He did not participate in any of the great World War II battles, but he did earn a Bronze Star for his service in China during the war. After the war, he became a general's aide. He attended Amphibious Warfare School. And then after Amphibious Warfare School, he got orders to go be a company commander. Initially, he went down to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, but upon the outbreak of the Korean War, and the expansion of the units on the west coast pending deployment to Korea, they moved Captain Barrow from Camp Lejeune to Camp Pendleton, where he took command of Able Company, 1st Battalion, 1st Marines, under the legendary Chesty Puller. Barrow led his company over the wall during the amphibious assault at Incheon. He led his Marines into the streets of Seoul during the liberation of that city. He re-embarked in amphibious shipping. They went around, they landed at Wonsan, and then he led his Marines up into the freezing mountain passes of North Korea towards a place called the Changjin Reservoir, or known to Marines as the Frozen Chosen, or what historians know as the Chosen Reservoir. Now, it was during the Chosun Reservoir campaign that Captain Barrow would become known for his combat leadership throughout the Marine Corps. The 1st Marine Division was pushed north by two recklessly by General MacArthur and General Almond. The 1st Marine Regiment was the Division Reserve was south at Koto Ri. 
there was an army task force that was sent east of Chosin, and the 5th Marine Regiment and the 7th Marine Regiment were pushed west of Chosin. They were fallen upon by seven Chinese divisions. And before long, the division was cut off and fighting for its life. The Army Task Force east of Chosin came apart under enemy pressure. Many of the soldiers went scampering across the ice to try to get back into the perimeter. At Hagaruri, one of the Army Lieutenant Colonels, Lieutenant Colonel Faith, was awarded the Medal of Honor for trying to organize resistance, but he was killed. And as the leaders of that task force were killed, the soldiers basically came apart as a unit. West of Chosin, a company from 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines, was isolated at Tak Tun Pass. You can see it in the little elbow there. And the regiment was trying to get to that company. They were surrounded for three days, fighting for their lives to hold that pass. When they were short of ammunition, 7th Marines sent a battalion led by Lieutenant Colonel Ray Davis. They did an eight mile overland march in a snowstorm with temperatures dropping to negative 40 degrees. They rescued Fox Company, and the division consolidated in the perimeter at Hagaruri. If we could go back to the map at Chosin. Okay, so now the division is consolidated at Hagaruri, that's right at the base of the reservoir. The Marines cut an expeditionary airfield out of the frozen ground, they evacuated their wounded, and they fought the 10 miles south to Kotori. You can see it right there where the first Marines was. They had another 10 miles to go to Chinhungni, which is the farthest point south, which would complete the breakout, but a key bridge across a pass, the Fanchillan Pass, had been blown by the Chinese, cutting off the breakout route. So what the division had to do was receive treadway sections that would be parachuted in by the Air Force. The engineers would have to repair the bridge and the division would have to clear the high ground around the bridge to allow the engineers to repair the bridge so the division could successfully comp complete the breakout. The prominent terrain feature overlooking the bridge site was Hill 1081. If we could go back, okay. All right. The former LSU student, waiter, janitor, who had grown up without electricity in his home, received the mission for his company to attack and seize Hill 1081 and then hold it at all costs to protect the Fanchillan Pass so the engineers could repair the bridge. For two perilous days on 9 and 10 December, it all depended on Barrow's Marines seizing and holding Hill 1081 to protect Fanchillan Pass. In the most difficult conditions imaginable, with temperatures dropping to negative 25 degrees, the Chinese threw everything they had against Captain Barrow's company. Barrow's company sustained 50% casualties, but they held Hill 1081, and something incredible happened up in those freezing mountain passes. Against impossible odds, Barrow's Marines held, the division's engineers repaired the bridge, and the 1st Marine Division successfully completed the breakout and achieved what will become an everlasting triumph in the annals of Marine Corps history, and indeed military history. Barrow received the Navy Cross. Barrow came back to the States. He was an ROTC instructor at Tulane University. He served as a plans officer for Lieutenant General Victor Krulak out in Hawaii. Remember, this is the pioneer of vertical envelopment, the military use of the helicopter. And then he became the commander of the 9th Marines Regiment in the Vietnam War. An Army General, General Stilwell, called Barrow the best regimental commander of the war because Barrow would not stay in the forward operating bases. He would put his Marines in helicopters and get out and attack the enemy. Upon his promotion to General, he was placed in charge of Marine Corps Base Camp Butler in Okinawa, Japan, and after that, 
Marine Corps Recruit Depot, Paris Island. Now, Barrow was also one of those Marines whose combat credentials were bulletproof. I mean, everybody knew about the Fenchelen Pass at the Chosin. His personal discipline and his deep humility enabled him to see goodness in the work that every Marine did. For example, in a letter he wrote to his boss, the three-star general in Hawaii, he said we need to do a better job of stressing the importance of duty in the supporting establishment. In other words, not every job that's important has to be a frontline combat job. He said, for example, We've all heard the clever comments about so-and-so ending up as the special services officer or the club's officer, but let me tell you, General, I consider those two jobs to be two of the most important in the Western Pacific. The special services officer is in charge of all the athletic equipment and the recreational activities for 20,000 Marines in the Western Pacific, and the club's officer is in charge of 800 plus employees that does seven million dollars worth annually in sales and is responsible for the health, morale, and welfare of all the Marines forward deployed in the Western Pacific. So Barrow sees value and the goodness in the work every single Marine does for their Marine Corps in their country. So when Wilson picked up the phone and asked for help, the right Marine answered at the other end and Wilson asked Barrow to come be his manpower chief. So now Barrow's in place. It is difficult to imagine a more qualified or powerful team of top generals to reform the Marine Corps' manpower crisis. Between the two of them, Wilson and Barrow, they had held every single position in the entire entry-level pipeline. Recruit, Barrow. Officer candidate, Wilson. Drill instructor, Barrow. Recruiting station officer in charge, Wilson. Officer candidate school commander, Wilson. ROTC instructor, Barrow. Basic school commander, Wilson. Recruiting district commander, Wilson. Marine Corps recruit depot commander, Barrow. They had also seen the other end of that pipeline in the most difficult conditions imaginable, at Guam and the Chosin Reservoir. So these generals knew what it takes to make a good Marine. And they would not let anyone within the institution or out dilute their deeply held conviction that the core strength of the Marine Corps was the high quality, character, and capabilities of the individual Marine. And they would put in place a series of reforms to ensure, to ensure that would always be the case. First, they raised standards. Wilson said, from now on, now it's 1975, Wilson raised standards. From now on, three out of every four Marines are going to be a high school graduate. We are going to go for quality. Second, we are going to toughen boot camp. We are going to place recruiting and recruit training under the same general at the recruit, recruit depots. This will toughen accountability. And third, we are going to aggressively remove from our ranks those Marines who are either unwilling or unable to get with the program and meet our standards. Now, it is not difficult to see the brutal interrelationship of these three reforms. And some of the Marine Corps senior leaders pointed these out to General Wilson and General Barrow. For example, okay, General, you are going to raise standards, raise recruiting standards on the mission you were already missing and missing badly. And now you're going to raise those standards, okay? Second, by putting recruiting and recruit training 
under the same general, you're naturally going to make boot camp attrition go up. So the recruiting entry level standard that you're already not meeting, now you're going to attrit more of those recruits from entry level training, which is going to give you even fewer Marines. Okay. And third, by aggressively kicking out of our ranks those Marines who are not getting with the program, you are going to make the recruiting mission that you're already missing even higher. General, you're not going to have a Marine Corps left. To which Wilson had a ready answer. If it's just me and my driver, we are going to have a quality Marine Corps. Now you get in step and you do it smartly. And he took this message out to the Marine Corps. And he started traveling around the operating forces giving this message. Now, the young majors and lieutenant colonels, when they heard this, the Krulaks, the Mundys, the Zinnies, when they heard this, they were empowered by it. Yes, we are the few, the proud. We're getting back to it. And he was starting to get momentum. And they were starting to become buy-in to the Wilson Barrow reforms. And then in December 1975, disaster struck. Private Lynn McClure was enlisted out of Texas. He was enlisted from the lowest mental group and might even have been legally retarded. He had dropped out of high school. He'd been charged with some felonies. He'd been erroneously listed in the Marine Corps somehow. And he ended up out at Marine Corps Recruit Depot San Diego, to which he quickly found himself in one of the motivation platoons. As the drill instructors could not get him to conform, they put him in a situation where the other recruits were beating him with things called pugil sticks. It's a tool, training aid used to teach bayonet fighting. And McClure was beaten so badly by other recruits that he fell into a coma and he died three months later. And Congress, expressing the will of the American people, said enough. And some of them started developing plans to take boot camp away from the Marines and have a joint training facility or have the Army do it. And they called General Wilson and General Barrow up to testify and explain themselves. So General Wilson and Barrow went up to the hill uh, in the spring of 1976. And they responded with a second series of reforms. First, and they told the Congress this, first, they eliminated the motivation platoons. There's a, this cartoon, by the way, was in Lou Wilson's archives. It says U.S. Marine Corps. That's the type of humor that was displayed. On a little article that Wilson had cut out in his archives, in all capital letters at the top, if they need motivation, kick them out, exclamation point. Wilson said they're going to eliminate the motivation platoons. Second, they would double the number of officers at the recruit depots to provide officer supervision. Third, they would do psychological screening of drill instructors to make sure there weren't inherently sociopathic or abusive personalities entrusted with training young Marine recruits. And fourth, each recruit would be provided a protected communication channel with their officer, with their series commander or their company commander, and they would all answer if they'd been physically or verbally abused. Now there's an anecdote from this period that shows General Wilson's determination to make these boot camp reforms stick. During a recess, of one of the testimonies, one of General Wilson's aides came up to him and said, sir, uh, 
I know what you testified. I called out there. San Diego has disbanded their motivation platoon. Paris Island has not yet disbanded it, but they've got the order. They just haven't, haven't disbanded it yet. To which Wilson, who was a big man, wheeled on his aid and said, by the time I go back in there to resume testimony, that platoon will be gone. The trembling aide relayed the message to the Marines down at Paris Island. They brought bulldozers from the engineering unit, which is on the other side of Beaufort, which I was fortunate enough to be in. Bulldozers are brought over that afternoon, and the motivation ditch where the motivation platoon trained was bulldozed into the ground, and the motivation pl platoon was indeed gone forever. And it's never returned, and there's no mention of it ever returning. So at these boot camp reforms, Wilson was able to gain the trust of Congress and the American people to keep boot camp. But the Marines still missed their recruiting mission in fiscal year 1976. And just like he had done at Guam and throughout his career, there was no talk of lowering standards. There wasn't any hand-wringing about the all-volunteer force not working. Wilson responded with another set of reforms. And this is the next round of Wilson reforms. First, he had one of his district commanders who had made general, General McMillan, write a book and make doctrine explain how the Marine Corps was going to re recruit. So he standardized recruiting across the Marine Corps with publication of a volume one, Guidebook for Recruiting Operations. Second, he had this general and his team of officers travel around the country and physically install the components of systematic recruiting in every recruiting station, and there's 48 in the country, and substation, and there's 550 in the country in the United States. So the officers and Marines went around, physically installed the components of systematic recruiting. Third, he created travel across the Marine Corps every year and select the best staff non-commissioned officers and non-commissioned officers, and there's some with us here tonight who've been selected by that screening team to select the best staff NCOs and NCOs to go out onto the streets of America to shape the future of our Corps. Fourth, the best staff NCOs and NCOs at recruiting would be incentivized to stay in the recruiting field and given a new military occupational specialty. This specialty would come to be known as the Career Recruiter MOS. And these outstanding Marines would have a path to promotion, a path to increased responsibility, and they would be charged with training the other new Marines in how this systematic recruiting worked. Fifth, a national training team was established to travel around the country to ensure that all of our, the recruiting stations were compliant with the guidelines of systematic recruiting. We're following the doctrine as spelled out in volume one. Sixth, they moved, removed the administration of reserve units from the recruiting districts. Wilson knew because he used to be a district commander the recruiting district commander used to have to be in charge of the recruiting mission and the reserve mission. And Wilson saw that this was too much in the all-volunteer era. Recruiting was a full-time job. So the reserves were taken out of the district commander's responsibility. And seventh, a recruiting management course was created that's taught up at Leesburg, Virginia in which every officer and senior staff and CEO and sergeant major coming into a recruiting station will go through the recruiting management course. It's two weeks long on which they would learn how systematic recruiting works. They would learn the system and they would learn how to lead and manage in the recruiting environment. 
Now, let me briefly explain the Wilsonian system of systematic recruiting. This, do we have any business majors out there? Or any human resource majors? Or anyone that's going to business? This is a virtual Rosetta Stone for you for getting and keeping top quality people into your organization. This is the system that Wilson had installed in 1977. This is a system that's been in place for the past 38 years, and it has been unchanged. First, you obtain names. As Wilson and Barrow identified that the type of people we want in the Marine Corps are those who stick with it, and they are high school graduate. The place we will obtain names is from high schools. High schools are where the quality market is. We would prospect from those names. We would screen out those who are not mentally, morally, or physically fit. And then with those young men and women left, we would sell them. And by selling them, meaning we would present them with a sales presentation to find out if they have what it takes to be Marines, if they want to be a part of our team. We have to talk to about 75 to 80 young men and women to find one Marine. And there are some young future Marines in here. You Marines who sat down with a recruiter, you look at all the benefits and opportunities of service in the Marine Corps. The type of young man or woman of character we are looking for is tough, smart, elite, and they are motivated primarily by the intangibles of the self-discipline, of courage, of leading because all Marines are going to lead. They are prepared, they are processed at a MEPS, they are prepared by our Marines in a pool program, they ship to recruit training, and when they graduate from recruit training, they come back to the streets of America, fully transformed into a US Marine, and they go back into their high schools, and they go back into their communities, and no one can believe it. They cannot believe how physically fit they are, how smart, how good they look. And that, of course, serves as a magnetic force for other talented young men and women of character who want to experience the same thing, the miracle of the transformation. Now, Wilson's reforms were working. The rest of the Marine Corps saw he's just not going to give up. He's not going to bend on standards. He's going to attack and reattack and reattack until we get the quality we need. And what started to happen is the Marine sense of elitism returned. General Wilson brought Barrow up to be his assistant commandant. And amazing things started to happen as you got top quality people into the Marine Corps. Remember those problems I talked about that Wilson inherited back in 1975, about training, about readiness, about conflict with the Navy over the future Marine aviation? He started to get at those. First, he created the Marine Corps Air Ground Combat Center at 29 Palms, California, which remains to this day one of the premier live fire training areas in the Marine Corps. It's where all of the units that deployed to Operation Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom receive their pre-deployment training. It remains a first-rate training area. Marines' warfighting readiness came back. Second, he created the Marine Aviation Weapons and Tax Tactics Squadron 1 at Yuma, Arizona that would train all pilots the tactics of close air support for amphibious operations. As I love to point out to my pilot friends, not only was MOTS-1 your premier aviation command created by a ground marine, but it was created by someone who was at heart a recruiter. I love to point that out to him. He created MOTS-1. Remains to this day the premier aviation training command in the Department of Defense. Third, The Navy wanted the Marines to get the F-14, but 
Wilson was successful in getting the Department of the Navy and the Congress to procure for the Marines the FA-18 aircraft and the AV-8B Harrier. The AV-8B AV Harrier can land almost vertically and the FA-18 is very likely, there's some debate about it, I'm not a pilot, but I've read enough about it. The FA-18 is very likely the most successful multi-role combat fighter in history. And Wilson got it for the Marines. And fourth, Wilson got the Commandant of the Marine Corps to become a full-fledged member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. See, the Marine Corps Commandant had only been invited to sit in on tank sessions on matters that were of vital interest to the Marine Corps, but Wilson saw that the Commandant was viewed as with lesser stature than the other service chiefs because of this, and as the American people's belief in the elitism of the Marine Corps returned, they said, no, we, the Commandant should be a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And Wilson got the Commandant to be a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Now, while the Marine Corps was undergoing this revolution in recruiting and making Marines, the other services suffered very poor performance in transitioning to an all-volunteer force. And there was a scandal in the late 70s in which the ASVAB test, the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery, had been misnormed. And by misnorming, it means it's a percentage-based test, and the other services had set the bar too high and had let several Category 4 applicants who otherwise would not have been qualified into their ranks. Congress demanded investigations. These investigations got the attention of former President Richard Nixon. And in 1980, Richard Nixon sadly wrote, I considered the end of the draft in 1973 to be one of the major achievements of my administration. Now, seven years later, I have reluctantly concluded that we should reintroduce the draft. The volunteer army has failed to provide enough personnel of the caliber we need. But if Nixon was declaring the failure of the all-volunteer force, nobody bothered to tell the Marines or their new commandant. To no one's surprise, in June 1979, General Barrow took command of the Marine Corps from General Wilson and had one order for his Marines. Keep in step, he told them. And every single Marine knew exactly what that meant. Barrow started talking about going all, all the way to 100% high school graduates in recruiting. He started letting all Marines know that maybe in peacetime, the most important thing the Marines could do was to recruit well, to make Marines. And he set a goal for more than tripling the number of women Marines from at the start of Wilson's tenure to get all the way up to 10,000. And while Barrow didn't advocate putting women Marines into the infantry or the combat, close combat jobs, Barrow was absolutely adamant that women Marines have an expanded role in the Marine Corps and that they have a way up. With his Marines in lockstep behind him, the hero of Fanchillon Pass would march the Marine Corps into a new golden age. A golden age that saw the establishment of the Maritime Prepositioning Force Program that's been used in every major theater of war contingency since their establishment. These are floating pre-positioned stocks of equipment that will marry up with Marines close to a crisis area. The establishment of forward deployed Marine Air Ground Task Forces that have responded to hundreds of crises and saved thousands of lives and remain out there forward deployed tonight, ready to respond to any crisis anywhere around the world close to hotspots. The complete eradication of drug use 
through an unrelenting campaign to get drugs completely out of our core, and of course, an very increasing quality and elitism on the recruiting and recruiting training side. The culmination of this revolution in Navy Marine, the very creation of the Superior Achiever Award in 1983, that recognized every recruiting station in the country that had seen its quality goals for all their
beneath the boss that someone else's job is to inspect those don't buy it know what's important get out and inspect it just like Wilson's doing here with these recruits in 1976 which of course brings me to the last lesson of General Lou Wilson that is people matter most I think that Wilson was able to achieve the broad reforms he did on so many fronts because he got the people right at the front end. You can get everything else wrong, but if you get people right, you're going to be okay. Whereas you can get everything else right, but if you get the people wrong, you're going to be in trouble. Wilson intuitively knew that people matter most. And it's something I tell my Marines all the time. The single most important decision any organization can make in the 21st century is who you bring aboard. As we look in closing at the mission and vision of this great college, and take a few seconds to, to read that. I hope that we can all agree that the lofty ideals of this great college were perfectly embodied in the person, the character, and the transformational leadership of General Lewis Hugh 
Wilson. 26th Commandant of the Marine Corps, Millsaps College, class of 1941. Thank you for coming out this evening. God bless you. Semper Fidelis.